I don't enjoy putting my face on socials and speaking to the camera and all of those fun things. But I knew that I had to do it. Some people that I speak to, they're like, oh, I just can't. I just can't do it. I'm like, well, why not? People will buy from you if you do. Why would you not try it out? Just test it out and see what kind of response you get. And I would, in the beginning, I still do, always making the audience and the community feel like they're a part of the journey. Hi, and welcome to the Bright Minds of E-Commerce podcast. I'm Dana, founder of Bright Red Marketing. And after helping so many businesses in the e-commerce space over the years, I wanted to bring you the best advice from Australian experts in e-commerce and e-commerce store owners. If you're wanting relatable stories and actionable advice and the latest Facebook advertising strategies, you're in the right place. Want help with your Facebook and Instagram ads? Remember, you can always book in a free strategy session at brightredmarketing.com.au forward slash free dash strategy dash session. We'll run through your ads, see what's working and what's not, and no sales pitch, I promise. So let's get into today's episode. Hi, and welcome to the Bright Minds of E-Commerce podcast. Today we're here with Rosie from Know the Rose. Welcome, Rosie. Thank you so much for having me. Hello. Hi, it's great to have you on the show. So can you tell us a little bit about your business and how you got started? Yeah, so my business is called Know the Rose and I sell naturally dried flowers. So Basically, I buy all of my flowers fresh and I hang them to dry over a couple of weeks naturally. I don't use any chemicals or preservatives or synthetic dyes, which is very common in the floral industry these days. So, yeah, it's all just a supernatural process that I just do in my studio. Imagine your studio is beautiful. All it time. is. It smells. <laughs> I, I'm told that it smells amazing, although I have to say I'm used to the smell now. So, unfortunately... Yeah, I can't. I can't smell it much anymore. Lovely. Tell us a little bit about how you got started, what that sort of process of of starting a business was like for you. So I started back in 2020, like most people, beginning of the pandemic. I was put down to I was put down to four days a week at work. And I wanted to make the most of my day off. So my one day off. So I was working as a graphic designer at the time. So I was still in a very creative kind of industry, but I was sitting at a computer all day. And I was missing that creative element of using my hands to create something. So on my days off, I just wanted to be super crafty. Like each week I would try something new. And yeah, just one week I had a bunch of fresh natives and I was like, I'm going to try drying these because I've never tried it before. And I was like, "Um, what to give it a go? Try something new this week. So I hung them upside down and I just really loved the process of watching them change over a couple of weeks. And then even though they're technically drying out and technically dying, they take on a new life of their own and it's a beautiful process to watch. So once they were dried out fully, I started creating bouquets and I just buy more and more fresh flowers and then hang them up to dry. Eventually my whole kind of garage was just a wall of flowers. I was taking over a bit. And then, it, yeah, just took off from there. So I'd make up bouquets, sell them to family and friends. Not that they really had a choice. I forced my product onto them. I was like, here's a bouquet. You need to give me money now so that I can buy more flowers. <laughs> but, yeah, that's kind of how it, all, how it all started. Amazing. Other than forcing people to buy your product, how did you sort of get those first non-forced customers? <laughs> <laughs> After a while, it was, it was forced for a, for a while, I'm not going to lie. We do what we got to do. <laughs> After a while, I decided that I wanted to launch, turn it into a website and kind of build something from it rather than just have it as a bit of a, a casual thing. I wanted to turn it into something bigger. So I decided to launch a website and that's when I start and, you know, building up the socials and all of that. And that's when those kind of real customers started coming in. They're I also did local ones. markets, which were real customers as well. Although my first couple were family and friends supporting me. <laughs> that's still nice. But I mean, yeah. the markets thing, I think is a, a really nice way, especially for those more creative businesses to sort of yeah. get out there, test your product, see what people like, see what people are interested in, answer all those questions and sort of get that live feedback. So I think markets is a, a really great way to sort of start businesses like that. Yeah, yeah, the markets were amazing. And although they were very, very time consuming and they were exhausting days, you know, you have to get up super early, pack everything up, head to the market before the sun's up and set up your stall before everyone arrives. Looking back, like I I didn't really enjoy doing the markets at the time because they were just such hard work. But looking back, it was, it was, I'm very glad that I did them and I got a lot out of them. And, you know, some of the 
local customers that I still have today first found me back at those markets. So yeah, I'm definitely glad I did them. Do you have any like top tips for people that are thinking about going to markets to make the most of it? Yeah, my biggest tip would just be stand out with your stall design. So, you know, you just, you go to markets and I I love going to markets. I go to markets all the time and you just, you see the same thing over and over. People have a trestle table, they've got a bit of linen on the top of the trestle and then they've just got their products on the table. That's it. They have a banner behind them. That's kind of it. And I went, I went hard with my stall design. Like I, I had to take two, I had my dad's ute, which we put all of my props in. And then that's all that I put. I couldn't fit my product in that car at all. It was just solely props. And then I had another car, which I took. So we took two cars every time. That's why I was such a good at <laughs> Yeah. And then I had the other car filled with my products. So I had rather than just, I still had the trestle with a bit of, you know, fabric over it, but I also had vintage suitcases. I had copper tubs. I had lots of vintage props that I used and I created something different that people automatic and I hung things from the ceilings people had to stop and they were like well what is this this is this is different so that's my biggest tip just create a bit of a wow factor because people go to market just to stroll through them and they they just mindlessly walk through them without really stopping to look at things properly but when you create that wow factor people have to stop and look at what you're doing and what you've got to offer so I love that. Yeah, look, just stand out. I think that's just great marketing advice in general. Like, yeah, people yeah. Do that with anything. their websites, they do that with their Instagram. Everything yeah. looks the same. I think having that that wow factor and changing things up, whether it's your markets, your Instagram, your TikTok, your website, any of those things can sort of make a huge difference. A lot of people just stopped and admired and and said, I, I absolutely love your stole. Like they didn't they didn't have to buy anything from me, but they always stopped and told me how much they loved my stole. So yeah. yeah. That's amazing. So when you went online, you said that you've launched your website and Etsy at the same sort of time. But what advantages and disadvantages did you find to doing both at the same time? Yeah, so I decided to launch my website and Etsy at the same time because I just thought, why not? I wanted to, I was still, it was still very new. I didn't have a big following and I just thought going on Etsy as well was just another way to reach people that I might otherwise not have, like people were able to discover me through Etsy, through their, you know, marketplace platform that if they were just doing a Google search, you know, my SEO wasn't good back then. I didn't know what I was doing with all of that. So they wouldn't have found me if they'd just done a Google search. But when I was on Etsy, they they were able to discover me. And the the great thing about Etsy is the way that you can optimize your listings with SEO means that, you know, you can come up first on that search page when they put in key keywords like dried flowers. I was going you know, I did a lot of research into the kind of ways that you can optimize that SEO on Etsy. And so I always ended up landing on that first page when they would search it. So, so I think that kind of played a big part. And the benefit as well was that when I was having the slower, slower weeks on my website, Etsy was there to keep me on track. And at least orders were coming through on Etsy when my website was slower. So yeah, yeah, I definitely think it was worthwhile. Wonderful. You then since decided to close Etsy, is that right? Yes, yeah, I've closed it. What sort of made that decision? How did that come about? Are you happy with that choice? (laughs) Yeah, I am. I am happy with it. So in the beginning, I'd say majority of my orders were actually coming from Etsy because of that discoverability. Mm -hmm. But over time, that kind of shifted and it eventually got to the point because I was pushing more on socials to people to go to my website. I never actually marketed that I was on Etsy. I didn't tell anyone. I didn't have a link anywhere. I didn't, I didn't push it at all. No one, no one really knew. Only the people who searched on Etsy knew. Mm -hmm. And so because I wasn't pushing it and because my following on social media started to grow, and I was pushing people to my website, that kind of, that shifted and more and more people were buying from online to the point where it got to like 99% of people were just buying online. And then I'd get a, an order from Etsy every now and then. And it got to the point where I was struggling to maintain like a high quality on both platforms. So I was just concentrating on my website, basically. I wanted that to be the, you know, where I put all of my time and energy. And then Etsy I found was, I, I just kept pushing it to the side. I was like, oh, I need to update listings. I need to 
I need to add new products. I didn't even get around to adding, you know, some new products on there. And, you know, you do need to stay on top of the SEO because, you know, keywords change and stuff like that, which I just wasn't doing. And it got to a point where I thought I'd rather just, you know, remove that because I was always feeling a bit guilty about it. I was like, oh, I really need to work on Etsy. I really need to update Etsy. And it was just always on my mind. And it just got to a point where I was like, this isn't worth my energy anymore. And then almost, you know, when orders did come through from Etsy every now and then, it was almost like, oh, I've got to, I've got to, I've got to do this Etsy order now. Like I'm so concentrated on the ones that I know that sounds bad, but it was taking, it was taking my mind off of the important things. So I just decided that it wasn't worth my time and energy updating it, it you know sounds like a sounds like a good decision I think yeah. there's look I'm a I'm a big fan of simplifying business like yeah. I think it sounds like Etsy was amazing for you and probably amazing for a lot of small businesses in that getting out there getting your first look customers the SEO component of that sounds really helpful but I feel like when you get to the point that you were at you know simplifying that down and working on things that are working best is always going to be the best decision yeah definitely so obviously your product is completely handmade. You're yes. buying flowers, you're drying them for weeks on end. What are some of the sort of challenges that you face with having a, a purely sort of handmade product? I'd say just my time. Time management is my biggest struggle. The pieces that I create are very labor intensive, especially the bouquets. Sometimes I wish I just had a product that I could just pick off a shelf, pop in a satchel and send it off and then do the next one. And it would be so quick and I'd get so much done throughout the day. But then I remember that the fact that they're handmade is what sets my business apart. It's what, it's my unique selling point. It's, you know, it's, it's what makes my business what it is. So I would never change that, but it is time management is my biggest struggle for sure. Yeah. (laughs) Is there any sort of ways that you sort of mitigate those challenges, make things easier for yourself? Yeah, so in the beginning, when I when I launched my business, I was only really doing bouquets and wreaths, which are both the bouquets, you know, they take time to to make up a really beautiful bouquet, but the wreaths as well just took hours to create one single product. And I was like, this is this is not okay. I need This is not sustainable. I need to switch (laughs) things up. So yeah. <laughs> so I very quickly realized that I needed to introduce different products that were much quicker for me to just pick and pack. So I I introduced a, a kind of collection which I call bunches, which are just basically a one singular species of flower like daisies or lavender. And all I have to do is wrap them up and pop them in a box. So uh, I introduced a lot of those as well as vases. I introduced a new collection of vases, which are great because that's something I can just pick off a shelf and wrap up. So I love that. But yeah, just introducing those new products definitely helped. And I found a lot of people love them. They love the simplicity of just a bunch of daisies rather than, you know, an an elaborate bouquet. So I do sell a lot of those, which is is good. And then when the when the bouquet orders do come through, I have gotten quicker as well over time. So that's definitely helped. <laughs> yeah, amazing. I think a lot of businesses can benefit from sort of adding those extra pieces. I think even if someone's buying a bouquet from you, they're more likely to buy a vase while they're there. Or they yeah, might be exactly. like, oh, I'll buy this for me and then I'll buy like a cute little bunch for a friend while I'm yeah. there. So I think anytime you can do those sorts of things, that's always a, a really good idea. Yeah. Uh, so we talked a little bit about how you marketed your business at the beginning. How has that sort of changed to how you market your business today? Like I said in the beginning, I was definitely doing a lot of markets to get to get the name out there and build awareness. So I was doing markets, I'd say probably once a week, otherwise maybe once a fortnight. And like I said, it was a whole big thing. Like it took a lot of time and energy just to do that one market and the thing with local markets is they're just they're just for a couple of hours, like all that time and energy. I'd spend an entire week prepping for a market for just a couple of hours on a Saturday or Sunday. And so even though that was good at the time, you know, building up that awareness, I got a lot of followers on Instagram from it and, you know, a, a lot of online sales from it too because people would take a card and then they'd go and, you know, buy online eventually. But now what I do, I've, I've now what I do is I do, I still do markets, but I do the bigger ones, and I do 
I do the markets that go over a couple of days. So I do like the big design and finders keepers, you know, those much larger scale markets that I can still spend all that time and energy prepping for them and leading up to it. But at least I know I'm going to get a solid couple of days return for it. And, you know, you can set up, put all that, all that energy into setting up the stall and you can just leave it for a couple of days. You don't have to pack down at the end of the day. You it's can leave it for two hours worth of stuff. Yeah. For, no. for oh, summer. I've got a van now, luckily. Yeah, so I fit it all in the van. But uh, yeah, that's that's the that's what I do now. Is I just I do I do bigger markets, but not as many. Yeah. And that's working much better for me. <laughs> Amazing. I love that. I I know that that's something that you are really good at. Something that you do in addition to the market to sort of build in those relationships on Instagram. I know that's something a lot of businesses find really hard. What are you sort of what have you found that sort of works best for your your business? So I, I honestly find that every time I show up personally, like on Instagram stories, I show my face, I show behind the scenes, that sort of thing. It the the difference in engagement from say compared to just a a shot of a bouquet or you know a product kind of post is is crazy. You get so much more engagement when people can connect with you and you know put a face to the brand and see what you're doing. So yeah, I just I just put myself out there even though I didn't enjoy doing that at all. I don't enjoy putting my face on socials and speaking to the camera and all of those fun things. But I knew that I had to do it. And you know some people that I speak to they're like, oh I just can't, I just can't do it. I'm like well, why not? People people will buy from you if you do. Like, why would you not do it? Why would you not, you know, try it out, just test it out and see and see what kind of response you get? Always making the audience and the community feel like they're a part of the journey. So getting them to help me name different bouquets, you know, getting them to cast a vote with what do they prefer, this or that, you know, just making them feel like they're on the journey with you and they're helping you gives them purpose as well and it you know creates this sense of community just really engaging the audience and bringing them in and sharing sharing random fun facts it doesn't always have to be product or brand related you can just share fun facts about yourself you know my community knows that I'm obsessed with my nephew everyone actually thinks he's mine because I post about him so often but I have to remind people he's just my nephew and yeah just little things like that where it's you don't always have to talk about your business or your product yeah I love that and I think I think your point is right and just why not like yeah why not if you starting a business is hard if you know it works then why not give it a go yeah exactly I know we've covered a lot of different things is there anything you think that we've missed in terms of big business lessons that you've learned things that you're really good at that you'd like to share my biggest tip would just be to give it a go I know that sounds really simple it's probably been said before but if you don't try you'll never know and you may as well just just give it a go just launch that product that you've been making in your spare time just put it out there on Instagram see what happens you know don't be afraid to try just put it out there and see where it takes you I really love that well I'll go into the last couple of questions we ask everyone do you have any strategies or habits that you follow each day to help you stay on track in business Yes. So every morning I read for at least half an hour. Usually they're business related books as well. So I'm learning, doing a bit of self development while I read them. And then sometimes I'll treat myself and read something that's not business related. And then as well, when I get into my studio every morning, I just pop my bags down and then immediately sit down and meditate just for five minutes. So I just like to clear the kind of energy and space and start the day with that mindfulness that I try and carry out throughout the rest of the day as well. I love that. I'm also a big reader and I tend to read not a lot of business books. They're not yeah. big fiction nerd. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a favourite business book or one that you've read lately that's been particularly powerful? Yeah, one that I've read lately, which I know has actually been recommended on your podcast before, is Shoe Dog by Phil Knight. It's the Nike story. It's incredible. It's I, I'd highly recommend reading it. It's just crazy to hear how they started from absolutely nothing and the insane obstacles that they had to overcome to get to where they are today you wouldn't have thought like such a huge company has gone through so much but they they have and it's definitely worth the read it has been on my list for a while because you're right it has been mentioned before yeah yeah. do you have a favorite podcast 
Yes, so the diary, the, what's it called? The Diary of a CEO by Stephen Barlett. It's a really, really interesting one. Lots of life lessons and insights into mm-hmm. entrepreneurship, but also just just life in general. It's it's a really cool one. I love that. And if people want to visit you and have a look at your amazing and beautiful flowers, what's the best way for them to do that? They can head online, just knowtherose.com.au. They can also follow along on Instagram and TikTok, which is just at knowtherose. Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for listening to the Bright Minds of E-commerce podcast. As always, you can find the show notes at brightredmarketing.com.au forward slash episode 41. Thanks for listening.